وقل رب زدني علما بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله So uh, alhamdulillah, uh, it's a pleasure to be here uh, with all of you today, mashallah. Um, inshallah, Mulan has given a sufficient introduction. So we'll jump straight into our, our session. Uh, also, being wary of uh, the time constraint. Now, just some disclaimers quickly, uh, because we don't want anybody throwing, you know, tomatoes at us through the screen or something. Um, so just some quick disclaimers that any advice that is given here you know, it's only for improvement purposes. We don't want anybody to use it as ammunition against their partner uh, or anybody for that for that matter. Uh, also, sometimes we do present, we do make generic statements, you know, about maybe men as a gender, women as a gender. Again, these are generic statements. It may not apply to every single man or every single woman, but generally this is, this is how, you know, gender behaviors. And... Again, we've tried our best to be to be balanced. Uh, we're, we're not trying to target any specific gender, but at the same time, we do try to deal with real issues that do affect each of the genders. Okay, so quickly, so this is the course overview for the masterclass itself. Um, so in the masterclass, we deal with, first of all, module one deals with everything to do with pre-marriage. So that involves when and where to look, what you're going to look for, choosing your spouse, and so much more. So, so much more, right? Then you have the during marriage sections, which are modules two, three, and four. So within that, you have how do you live a happy married life? What are the ingredients? Secondly, this whole, you know, this, uh, this, this concept of a honeymoon period. Is it possible to maintain a honeymoon period after your first six months or one year or two years? And if so, how do you do that? And then thirdly, conflict resolution. How do you deal with conflict? How do you prevent conflict from happening? Uh, today's seminar is uh, fits into maintaining a lifelong honeymoon period uh, and also overlaps with, you know, living a happy married life. So there's a bit of overlap there. And also just to also clarify that this seminar goes into a lot more detail about one specific topic compared to the masterclass. So whereas in the masterclass, mashallah, we cover everything from A to Z. Today, we're going to look at P, positive marriages, but go into a lot of detail, inshallah. So that's how the seminar differs from the masterclass. Okay, inshallah, I'd like to pass it on to uh, Mufti Sab now to deal with uh, the actual content for today. Uh, um, Bismillah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, everybody. I hope everybody is well, uh, wherever you are. And uh, yeah, firstly, uh, we start with the praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make this uh, uh, this meeting of ours fruitful, beneficial um, for the right reasons, for seeking the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala firstly. And um, learning, learning how you know, in, intricately how amazingly Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he gives us everything, you know, the solution to everything we see in this world. And um, uh, that's the main gist of everything, inshallah. So you see this uh, this particular seminar that we've uh, put together um, covering regarding positive marriages, peaceful marriages. So here we have the foundation of a positive and peaceful marriage. And in order to understand how to have a positive and peaceful marriage, we return back to the kalam of Allah, the, the Quran, in which we see that there is the basis of everything. You see, I'm sure everybody knows here. Um, everybody is the a student of knowledge, you can say. But just to serve uh, uh, as a reminder for people as well, and maybe for, for many of us, um, an understanding of, how we are meant to look at the Qur'an for every single solution, isn't it? Uh, and we look deep enough, we ponder enough, and inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will open up for us. So we've, I've picked this particular verse here, where, you know, um, we understand that our scholars have derived a lot of inspiration for, um, in, in, um, in giving us like a comprehensive, a way of understanding what marriage is all about 
So I think I think when we see this verse, you will see that it forms that it forms to be the foundation of a positive and peaceful marriage. So this verse here, Wamin uh, let's break it down. Allah Ta'ala mentions Wamin Ayatihi for the people who know the verse already, Wamin Ayatihi and Khalaqalakum min and Fusikum Azwajal Litaskun Ileha, Wajala Bainakum Mawaddata wa Rahma. So let's break this verse down. Um, a little bit of tafsir for us here as well. That uh, the first part Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that uh, from his signs, and then this is obviously from a passage where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he discusses regarding his signs, and um, from amongst these signs, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he is giving us, which obviously the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala demand us to reflect and um, reflect over what we have to think, reflect over you know, um, pointing us towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what the main thing is here, isn't it? His oneness, his qualities, you know, um, the, how graceful he is, how um, giving or, you know, how much he gives to us in terms of how merciful he is, how, you know, everything. All of these qualities Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be pointed out to us in this particular verse. So when we are going through this verse, I want everyone to now think, because I will ask at the end, inshallah, I want everyone to think, what signs do you see um, are coming through for you that point towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? What's it pointing out to you, inshallah, okay? So, next, وَمِنْ آيَاتِ That's the ayat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We see, أَنْ خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنْفُسِكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا So, he has um created for you spouses from amongst yourselves. So we see khalaqa lakum, Allah says, meaning he has created for you. So this is the favor of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creating for us a spouse. So he created for man, he created woman, and for a woman he created man. So he created for us spouses. Then he says, Min anfusikum a partner from within your own species. So we have Hawa alayhi salatu wasalam being created for Adam alayhi salatu wasalam and Adam alayhi salatu wasalam being created for Hawa. So you see min anfusikum from amongst your own selves and obviously Mufassimun mentioned that if you want to take the most literal meaning of this, we know that um, Hawa alayhi salatu wasalam was created from from the rib of Adam alayhi salam, Adam alayhi salam. So this is directly min anfusikum from within yourselves. He created azwaj and azwaj meaning your partners. So everything it is created in pairs. We see, I'm sure many of you know how um it was only it wasn't only it was not too long ago when it was discovered that everything has a, a pair. We knew from uh, many years ago that obviously um, the the animals have a male and a female, but uh, it was not too long ago where they discovered that even plants have male and female. So, I mean, if you look more into it, then you will see that other creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they all have a, a, a partner, they have a pair. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created more or less everything with a pair. And this points out, this highlights the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is again going back to that first part we talked about. I mean, so it's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's sign pointing towards him, his oneness, towards his favors we have over here, we're mentioning. Then the next part Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا so that you may find comfort in them. So peace, comfort, tranquility, this is probably the number one quality sought in marriage. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions it first, that uh, everyone looks for some sort of comfort, some sort of settlement, comfort, and what do you say, uh, tranquility, wanting, wanting that contentment of heart, that's what a partner can give to a person. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has kept that in this relationship. So the Quran, 
you know, just in you know, interest interesting, you will see that the Quran also mentions that uh, um, another thing that has peace in it, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created sukoon uh, in it, is the night. So we see that uh, that's, this is probably why many a people, many a couples, uh, during the day they may not be able to spend too much time together, but at night time when they're spending that night time together, either just sitting down and talking or whatever else that they're doing, spending that time at night together, it creates a, a, a tremendous bond. A, so the ultimate peace is when we are spending the night together with our spouse. So you see when a person is... Um, spending time with their spouse, then this comfort will be attained, inshallah. Then Allah, Allah says, وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّةً وَرَحْمًا This is very interesting. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, وَجَعَلَ وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ And He has placed, He has made, He has placed between you compassion and mercy. So meaning, as soon as a person, can you, you can just imagine, understand this, yeah? Two people don't know each other. And unfortunately, many a times in this world that we live in, in this time we know it, we, we live in, we see that two people many a times, they know each other already. They're already talking. They're already maybe even going out with one another and everything. But then they decide to make it halal. For the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they, uh, they exchange, you can say the ijab and qabul, they exchange this... Um, offer an acceptance in front of two witnesses and a nikah takes place. It's such a simple thing. It's If you think about it, it's so easy, so simple, so short. You know, one person offers, the other accepts, and that's it really. That is it. That is done. But that one small little thing, it creates that this particular thing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about here. It's like as though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is placing between this husband and wife now, he is placing these two qualities, mawadda and rahma. So Allah is saying here, it's not that you get married to your partner and you have to now create this mawadda and rahma. No, no. Allah is saying, I will already place there for you, I've already created there for you, this mawadda and rahma. Okay, this compassion, intense love, you can call it mawadda, and this rahma, this mercy. So, why these two qualities we want to analyze? Okay, why these two qualities? So, different, you know, Mufassirun have mentioned different reasons as to why these two qualities, but quite simply, if you understand it in a very, very logical way, the, the reason why Allah would be highlighting these two qualities is because. These are key ingredients in maintaining that litaskunu ilayha, which Allah mentioned already. That litaskunu ilayha, you want that comfort in your marriage, you want to maintain your marriage, you're going to have to upkeep these two qualities, mawadda and rahma. And I've not kept it for you to create these qualities for yourself. I'm not saying go and create it for yourself. I, in fact, place these two qualities from the off. From right from the beginning of your marriage, I'm placing these two qualities, mawadda and rahma, already there for you. All you have to do now is maintain them. Maintain this mawadda, maintain this rahma. And you will see that when you do get married, there is an intense love. There is this love that the couple enjoy. That's where you call this honeymoon period, where everything goes. And there's mercy, there's compassion for one another, where you feel empathize for what you know for one another and then unfortunately for many people when they don't maintain this when they don't learn how to maintain this and they 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 you know they keep doing things to violate against these two qualities then these two qualities start to diminish and they start deteriorating and their relationship becomes um very stale and these two qualities are no longer there in their marriage so this is unfortunately what happens and this is something that, inshallah, in this particular seminar, we'll be concentrating on looking at this verse. If you want to try to, if you want to think about this in this way, 
then this verse, you can say, this verse is in essence everything that we're going to be talking about today will be will be the tashrih, will be the explanation of this verse. Because this verse does it for us. This verse explains everything for us of how to have this positive and peaceful marriage. How do you have this تَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا How are you going to have that? It's, the, it's in this verse. Everything is there. So inshallah, hopefully, during the course of today, we'll be exploring regarding this um, and expounding upon this. So, um, you know, there's many other understandings of this mawadda and rahma. Some have explained that, uh, you know, it's it's mawadda at the beginning when you're young, that's mawadda. And then as you grow older through your age, then that mawadda may not necessarily be there when you're now 60 years old, for example. It may not be that same mawadda, but it will turn into rahma. And that's how in old age you will be able to continue living with one another. So some have explained it in this way. Um, some have explained that it's the love and protection that, that people enjoy in marriage. I mean, these are two key ingredients. Some say mawadda refers to intimacy and rahma refers to the children because obviously children are a sign of mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when Allah grants us this. Uh, you know, it's mutual mercy that we have for one another. It's the that love, that compassion, you know, um, all of this has been explained in detail by Mufassirun. So, lastly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he ends this off before he goes on to another sign. He says, Inna fi la That surely in this are signs for people who reflect. So now, like we started off with, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ I told everybody to reflect and to think, right? Um, before I ask everybody else, um, let me ask uh, our Murad um what, what do you uh, deduce? What kind of signs do you, can you see for, for contemplating over this verse? So um, this verse, um, and one thing that we know about the Quran is that wherever it says, you know, ayat, Allah is, uh, subhanahu wa ta'ala, is inviting us to reflect. Now, just, just to take out one part here, uh, which Muftisab also talked about in much detail, the concept of mawadda, love. Uh, and love is obviously something uh, that has to be experienced more than, uh, more than defined and explained. But when I reflected upon this verse, one thing that I realized is that after I got married, I understood what love really meant. And that understanding then opened up to me the understanding of much of what I had learned during my studies about the love that the awliya of Allah had for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Meaning the love that we have as spouses for one another actually teaches us what love should be for Allah. Um, and let me give you some, what, what do I mean by that? So for example, in many of my durus, and many of the students will, will have heard this, I heard this phrase. My teachers often say, Hasanatul Abrar, Sayyatul Mukarrabin. Hasanatul Abrar, Sayyatul Mukarrabin. That the good deeds of the righteous ones are like the bad deeds of those who are extremely close to Allah. Now, I used to hear that and I used to think, okay, theoretically that makes sense. But I don't, it doesn't, I don't fully understand. And it was only when I got married and I started to experience this love for my spouse that I really appreciated this statement. That what did it mean when the awliya, when they say hasanatul abrar sayyatul muqarrabin in their relation with Allah? Well, it meant that just like when your spouse says something to you, you know, if your spouse says a rude word, for example, if somebody else says that exact same thing to you, it doesn't really hurt. But when the closest person to you, your spouse, says those exact same words, it suddenly pains so much that it hurts in the heart. So, through that love of the spouse, I started to understand what the ulama meant when they said, Hasanatul Abrar, Sayyatul Muqarrabin. Other things, when, when a person loves their spouse, for example, when a, say a person falls in love, they will go to the extent, you know, nowadays you have social media. If you fall in love, imagine you fall in love over social media, and I'm not encouraging this, by the way, with somebody from another country, and you don't even speak their language. But once that love enters the depths of your heart, you would be willing to learn an entire new language to communicate with your beloved. That's the power of love. 
So then we should have the same type of love for Allah, where we know his message is in Arabic. We want to learn the Arabic to be able to appreciate his message. When you're in love with somebody, right, you want to spend long hours with them in intimate conversation with them, getting to know each and everything about them. When you're by yourself, you spend time reflecting about them, thinking about them, thinking about their idiosyncrasies, their unique qualities, what makes them amazing, what you love about them. This is the same relationship that we as believers want to have with Allah. So by placing this mawadda in marriage, Allah has given us this blessing and also made it a wasila, a means, a ladder to be able to appreciate and gain the greater love, which is ultimately, وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَشَدُّ حُبًّا لِلَّهِ Those who believe are most intense in their love for Allah. So that's just one reflection. And I mean, if you think about it more and more, you will see the different signs of love that occur in a marriage and how those relate to our love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mashallah, mashallah, amazing, amazing reflections, amazing points that you mentioned. I mean, um, for everybody else, um, if you want to, if you want to mention, if you want to type, if you want to actually mention any um points of reflection for yourselves, more than welcome to uh, to 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 share that, inshallah. And we have a lot of people here. I do hope that we'll be a little bit interactive. Yes, I mean, I don't like to be. Uh, talking to myself or talking to Bolivar only, yes. I, I do hope everyone will um, join in in terms of uh, contributing, inshallah, to make it a little bit interactive. Okay, I mean, you can use the chat and um, or you can, you can even speak into the mic if you think... Uh, okay, shall we... Move on to the next slide, inshallah. Okay. Mulema, do you want to take this path? I think somebody's raised their hand. Uh, perhaps they have a, a question, maybe. Um, you can type your question on the chat uh, if you prefer. Um, otherwise, uh, you can ask as well. It's not a problem, inshallah. And like we said at the end, inshallah, we will have some dedicated time for QA as well. Okay, so as Muftisar mentioned, uh, we're here today talking about positive marriages. So, what are the ingredients that make up a positive marriage? Right? So, to break it down very nice and simply, positive marriages have these main ingredients, which we're then going to elucidate much more. Number one, positive deeds. And those deeds which create positivity, love, happiness in a marriage. Plus, right, and again, this is not math, so don't be scared. All right, positive assumptions, right? So in your marriage, you're always thinking positively. Yeah, you're, whenever your partner does something, you're assuming the best out of the action. And thirdly, a general positive mindset. So your entire mindset, which permeates your existence, permeates your relationship, is a mindset of positivity. Uh, and this will ultimately lead you to the positive and peaceful marriage that we all want. This is what we are talking about. This is the framework that we just want to present to you as we now elucidate a little bit more. Would you like to give some examples of uh, our positive marriage and what actions that a person can do? So um, now, now to expound upon um expound upon i mean there's a question can we can we uh screenshot the slides i mean uh you can screenshot for your own for your own self just to obviously try not to share to other people the reason is because we don't want people to start thinking they've understood the the course because what happens is um many a times people see the screenshots of a particular course and then they don't come for the actual course because they think they've done it so um, obviously, as you can see for yourself, uh, the, the slides are just some um, of what we are, inshallah, trying to uh, try and impart to you, inshallah, okay? Alhamdulillah, we have some good comments here as well. Um, some people are saying they never had honeymoon period. So we'll, we'll go through some of the questions, inshallah, to, um, to, inshallah, share. I mean, you can also note down which numbers of 
and whatever else that you want. And inshallah, we'll, 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 we'll go through that at the end. But if we keep stopping the presentation right now to go back and things, then it's going to take too long to get through the rest of it, okay? And we won't finish on time. So um, without uh, further delay, inshallah, we'll continue. Um, so what makes a positive positive marriage, right? So it's the small things that you have to you have to continue and maintain to do. Like I said to you, Allah Ta'ala has already placed that mawadda and rahmah. So now, what do you have to do? You have to you have to do, for example, you see you have a main thing you see here, that like you have a positive attitude. So you have, like we're talking about, small steps, baby steps. And it's these small, small things that you do will eventually lead you on to having a very, very strong bond with your partner. And that's what everyone wants, I'm sure. So you have to do, for example, this positive attitude is vital, right? You have to sometimes take what your partner does in positive light rather than looking at it in a negative light. I mean, inshallah, that you will start to understand as we go along, inshallah. But um, other things like you see here, you express happiness and smile. So when you meet your partner, meet them like you would meet a, meet a friend. Many a times, unfortunately, I get many cases where people complain, partners complain, saying things like, oh, when they're on the phone talking to their friend, then they're all smiling, ha ha, he he, and everything else. But when they're talking to me, it's a sad face or it's a straight face or it's like a very rude tone, the way they approach me. So why is that? You have to ask yourself this question, that why is it that I'm, I'm doing this? I mean, you could be, you could be in a sad mood yeah, but when you bump into somebody that you haven't seen for some time, you would put on a smile. You would actually meet them with a happy face, especially if they're smiling towards you. You would do that actively. So why not do that for your partner? Yeah, we have to ask that question to ourselves. So you meet each other with a smile, with a, pos with a positive vibe, with enthusiasm, like you wanted to meet them. You are happy to see them. So this expresses to your partner that you actually appreciate them. You actually want to be in their company. Not that you dread being in their company. So this is something important. Um, another thing we could do, for example, we could hug and hold hands. So, you know, when you, many a times, I, again, another thing that I get complaints of, um, and I don't know what it is, I get this complaint more from men than in than women. Um, that I want to hold her hand, but she's like, oh, um, I don't hold hand in public. Uh, and he's like, what's wrong with that? Like, I'm just holding a hand. I'm not doing anything else. I'm not doing any vile thing. I'm just holding a hand. But many a times, a man would want to hold her hand, would want to hold your hand, you can say, is why? Because he wants to, he wants to feel as though he's fulfilling his role as a caretaker. He is you know, looking after his wife. Yeah, so he wants to show that. He wants to express that. So I would say that try not to reject this particular gesture from your partner because the time may come when he will not want to do it anymore because you've rejected him too many times. Or if it's the other way around where the wife wants to also hold the, the husband's hand, then there should be no reason why you would not want to hold or hug. You know, there should be no reason for um, for rejecting that, so these are small things that a partner can do. You know, you 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 meet. I'm sure you, you when you meet a friend after a long time, you hug you 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 give a you give a good handshake. And uh, I always ask this question to people: that when was the last time you did that to your wife? If you've been married for a long time, when was the last time you actually came home and met your wife, or when you or the other way around? If if the wife came home and you saw your husband. You actually met them like a, like you would meet a friend. Uh, you have to ask this question, like, how, how many times do I do this? Uh, use caring address. Use address when you address each other. Use things like whatever it is you want to use. I mean, you know, some people might find certain addresses a little bit cheesy, maybe. They'll find it a little bit cringe, maybe. Yes, but that's fine, absolutely. If you don't like calling your, your partner babe or you don't like them calling, you don't like calling them darling or honey or something, right? No problem. Find something else that's suitable. Find something else that you like. Okay? So, um, but, but addressing them in a caring, kind way, not with a nickname they don't like, 
but something which they which which shows your love towards them this is way better than calling them directly by name or calling them by by um how can i say by ca calling them in a rude way or even calling them like saying something like oi or i i just dealt with one case where um, the husband he the, the wife complains that the husband calls her by doing a a sound like pss, pss, like that like i mean that's not a way of addressing your spouse right obviously um the spouse will feel as though you are degrading degrading them but these are small things that you would you would not want to do so find an address a caring address okay so these are things i mean you have so many other examples small small things like for example give thanks when your partner does something even if you think that this is something that you know maybe um is normal uh, it, it, for example your partner took you out or your partner made you a meal normal meal give thanks say oh, this was amazing, thank you. I was like, okay, that's a bit unusual. Normally I make a meal and you never said anything. But yeah, I mean, say that thanks because it goes a long way. And, um, you know, um, share gifts. Yeah, sharing gifts. Uh, obviously, that's an obvious one. I don't have to expound too much upon that one. Everyone understands these are small, small things that we can do. You know, send a nice text message. You know, it's, it's free nowadays. You know, I remember a time when, uh, for those people who are old enough will know, uh, I remember a time, and or maybe those people who live in certain countries, that uh, sending a text message would cost you, right? Sending a text a text message was over here, fifty p a text message, right? Uh, so it's no longer it's no longer charged. It's free, absolutely free. Yeah, and if you're um, if you have the internet, you WhatsApp will be free. So send a text message randomly during the day, you know, missing you or remembering you or just just say something, right? And that will show your partner that you are actually thinking of them, right? So these are just random things that you can do during the day. It actually helps your your marriage. Um, you know, give salam, like I talked about already, give salam enthusiastically when you come, you know, compliment one another. That's again, something that you should do, like you look nice today, especially when your partner has made an effort for you. You know your partner has made an effort for you. Be attentive to that, you know, don't just ignore it, right? Give a compliment because then this encourages them to do more for you, okay? Then, um, you know, overlook and forgive. You have to, in marriage, you have to overlook certain things. You can't, you know, be picky, nitpicking, nitpicking in every single little small thing that your partner is doing. You have to turn a blind eye, blind eye on certain things, because remember, you're living together. When you're living together, there are gonna be times when, as a human being, you make mistakes, you do things, that may not be perfect, but you can't highlight them. Yeah, we're nobody, nobody, none of us are perfect. So when we ourselves are not perfect, then why is it that, that we are picking out on small things regarding a partner? Overlook them, right? Let, let them go. And that will allow us to have a positive marriage. Forgive and forget. Then um, adopt their likes, so learn regarding things they like. For example, they like to go out shopping. They like, uh, you know, spending time in this way. Okay. They like to do this. They like to do that. You know, learn their likes and try to adopt those likes so that you can start to share things. If they like to go for a walk, you know, just, you know, they like to, you know, see nature, you know, adopt their likes. Right? You know, if you adopt their likes, inshallah, you start to share a lot of times together and you will have a lot of memories that you will create together, inshallah. Good memories. Then value one another. Very important. You have to value your partner. If you do not value your partner, who will? Who will value your partner is the question. And you yourself want to be valued. So if you want to be valued, you're going to have to reciprocate. You're going to have to value your partner as well. Eat together. This is... Another one, yes, like a lot of times people, partners, I find that many times come to me with problems. I ask them basic things, simple things that they're not doing together. And I'm like, why aren't you doing this together? Why? What's the reason? And they have no good reason. There's absolutely no, no good reason as to why they're not doing it together. So eating together is one small thing. Why? Because it creates mahabba, it creates love. It creates that, that bonding time together. And whilst you're eating, there should be no phone. There should be no TV. There should be no other distraction. You 
and your partner and you're eating together. If you've got kids, you've got children, then no problem. If you haven't fed them already, they can be eating together as well. And then you, like we understand from the ahadith of Rasulullah that you give a morsel to your partner. One morsel to your partner will give you the reward of sadaqah and this will create love. This will create that love that you are desiring, that small little thing that you're doing, you know, and then obviously giving a morsel to your children if they're there as well. This will create love. You are praying the du'as that we know. You are praising Allah. You are remembering the food being a ni'mah, a blessing. You're reminding the people who are there, look how, look at this food. This is a ni'mah. Look at this blessing. And look at the people around us, what's happening. Look at the world. We're seeing this on the news. They don't get food and things like this. There's so many things to reflect on rather than being jarred onto your phones. Phones should be banned on the dastarkhan. There should be no, no allowance of phones or anything like that whilst you are eating. So these are things that we should we should really hold on to. Then enjoy hobbies together. Again, this is similar to adopting their like. So hobbies that you have, you know, you like to do certain hobbies or they like to do certain hobbies, try to do them together. Try to do and accommodate in a way whereby you are, you know, spending this, this kind of time together. And another example is obviously make dua for them. This is vital. If you make dua for your partner, not I'm not talking about dua like, oh Allah, make us really good for each other. You know, Allah, you know, um, bless our relationship. You know, give give us you know beautiful children. That's a dua which obviously you meant to make, but that's a dua which is for yourself too, right? But you want to make a dua which is completely selfless, uh, not any degree of selfishness in it at all. So you're making a dua for your partner. Oh Allah, give give my partner, whoever it is, say their name obviously, and say, oh Allah, grant them Jannatul Firdaus. Oh Allah, grant them your nearness. Oh Allah, grant them your, your mahabba, your love. Oh Allah, grant them the best of this world. Grant them the best of the hereafter. Just making dua for them. Just pure dua for them. And that dua we know, when you make dua for somebody, it creates love in their heart for you. So, these are just examples that I'm giving. I'm sure everybody can now, hopefully this is Food for thought for everybody, creates ideas for everybody and gives you small, small things to do. None of them are breaking the bank. Yeah? None of these things are, you know, telling you that you have to do something where it's going to take so much effort. It's going to take so much money. It's going to take so much time. Nothing like that. OK, so these are things that are easy things to do. But these small things are the things that create and maintain that mawadda and the rahma, that positive marriage we talked about. So, um, so I mean, Mashallah, Mufti Sabs mentioned a, a number of uh, small, small deeds. Uh, would just like to know from you know everybody listening, uh, if there's any ideas you guys can perhaps share with everybody as well, uh, maybe from your own marriages or experiences of other small, simple things uh, that are very, very effective in building this positive marriage. So you can share them uh, on the chat or just speak them out. Uh, and inshallah, we can also benefit from some of these ideas. Uh, and also, while, while people are thinking or uh, putting their ideas down, uh, just a question with this up uh, on this last slide. Uh, a, uh, one of the participants has asked, could you give an example of how we can value our partner. So how you value your partner is, for example, the things they do, you, you show a verbal appreciation for it. And also if it's something that you can show physical appreciation for it, like for example, they made the effort to make something for you, you, you eat it, you eat it and you enjoy it, right? For example, because that's what they did for you. Or if they made something where they bought something for you, you wear it, right? So this shows that appreciation towards your partner that their efforts have been appreciated. So this is showing value to your partner, right? Mashallah, we're having some very good uh, suggestions, yes? Uh, I'd, I'd also add on uh, to that point about valuing one another. That, mashallah, especially at the beginning, when we're in that honeymoon period, we should value the, the relationship that we have there. And the way we value it is by maintaining the mawadda and rahmah that we have by doing all of these things. 
Uh, so trying to not become complacent, because what can often happen uh, is that especially with people who have very good marriages, it's very easy to become complacent, uh, to lose value for your partner, and then things start to slide down from there. Absolutely. Um, these are amazing, uh, and very good, and very good suggestions, you can see. I'm sure everyone can read them anyway. I don't know if we need to go for all of them, but. Somebody's yeah. also added in regards to valuing the spouse that affirming what your spouse has done for you and its effect on you by telling them the effect it has on you, uh, they will increase. And that's also 100%. very, very good. Very good. Very good. That's a very good suggestion. Definitely. You know, and, and one thing that you need to do also is that if you like something that your partner does, you need to express that, that, you know what, you did this. I liked it a lot. So like if you liked them saying um, good morning to you, or if they like, if you liked, you know, because I dealt with one case that you know he never says good morning to me, and he's like, oh, I didn't know you, you, you want that? You should have just said that. It's so easy for me. I'll just say it. Uh, so like that. I mean, it's 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 the smallest things that you like. If you like what your partner does, smiles at you, whatever it is that you just have to express that. Yeah, they have to know that you liked it, right? They dressed up for you. You know, you show, you express that they, you like this, and then they'll do this further. So yeah, that's very important as well. Yeah, these are very good, very good suggestions, leaving a note. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so Alhamdulillah, there we've discussed what I think we would say is the easy part of the marriage. Yeah? The small, simple things that you can do daily, inshallah, uh, to keep this positivity. Now, for the rest of this time, inshallah, we want to discuss perhaps what is the slightly harder part. And that is those factors that often prevent a positive marriage. So we've discussed deeds to do which create that positive environment. Now there are things to avoid because these things prevent this positivity. Um, and to break it down a little bit further, you have problems in marriage that you create. Now you can call it a man-made disaster, a problem in marriage that you create yourself. What are those, inshallah, we'll discuss those in a bit more detail. And the other problems that often arrive in arise in a marriage are problems that, not, that you have not created, but that have come upon you externally, right? So the second one's a bit easier to explain, right? And we'll discuss that first. But it could be, for example, you know, uh, you, you, you had a child, but it happened that your child was born with a certain disability, for example. Now, somebody could see that as a problem and it's come upon you. It's not in your control. Well, how are you going to deal with that? Because that, it, that could be something which completely saps away the positivity and the love that was in that marriage, right? Whereas if a, a, approached in the right way, as we're going to discuss, it could instead become something which further reinforces and strengthens the family. And often children with disabilities turn out to be very, very big blessings for spouses and families. You know, I know a family very well who they, they had their third child was a disabled child. And subhanAllah, they say that that child came and taught them how to live life. And it bonded the couple together in a way that they were not bonded before that child. Right? So certain problems come. If we approach them in the right way, as we're going to discuss, these can become ways to strengthen and further reinforce our bond. Okay, so oh, now yeah. to, to, to try to understand, the, to explain this kind of thing, right? This kind of concept, what we're doing is now, um, let's say these problems that occur, um, you could, like Mona mentioned, you could either make it a problem that, that further then compounds and creates more problems in your life because of the way you're reacting, or you could, you could, you know, take it as an opportunity and um, make it something that uh, improves you and maybe draws you closer to Allah, okay? So what we've seen, what I've seen, is that marriages generally break up and this this mawadda and rahma that we're constantly talking about maintaining, that breaks generally for people when, when does it break? So let's understand that, okay? When does it break? So generally, when do things break? Let, let's see. Let's say, for example, you have a uh, a ruler. You're bending a ruler, right? And um, it snaps. 
where will it snap from? Where do you think, everybody? Will it snap from the middle? Will it snap from one end? Will it snap from, I don't know, where, wherever it's the, uh, the or something else, let's say something else, it might be um, some other reason as to where it would snap. Where do you think it would snap? The middle, where you apply most force, yeah, most tension, yeah. So generally, yeah, generally, things break, right? Things break at the point of the greatest stress, okay? The greatest stress, where it is, where that point is, that's where generally things will break, yes? So if you have, for example, another example, you have a rubber band, right? You're pulling on this rubber band. Um, where will it rip? Where will it tear from? Where will it snap from? It'll snap from the point of greatest tension. Yes, wherever that point is, that's where it looks like it probably snaps. Where it will probably snap from. Yes, everybody. So this is um, one example, right? So it may not necessarily like the ruler. It may not necessarily crack directly in the middle, right? It may crack, at, like you're saying, at the weakest point. At the weakest point at the point of most tension, things like that people are saying, yes, the way you're applying the most force. So in exactly the same way, when we have our marriages, right, marriages break up when they are under strain, under stress, where you are, you know, at your weak point, where you are putting great tension and pressure, okay? So for example, for example, a person, one of the partners loses their job and now their, you know, their livelihood is at stake you know they are unable to provide now and they're under great stress the, the the family are going through a lot of problems because of this so now what happens it it leads to sometimes a breakup or at least it leads to this breakup of mawadda and rahma between them because they're not talking to each other the way they should be or like for example a loss of child right or illness okay these are other examples of when we can see that uh, these are the difficult times that a person goes through and it leads to these uh, strains in a person's marriage. So the question and, and, and the logical conclusion from that then is that if we learn to cope with those strains better, better. right? So meaning when uh, a, a, the husband has lost his job, not job, for example, or the wife has fallen ill, for example, if we learn to cope with those strains better in the right way, then inshallah, it won't lead to a marriage breakup, right? Which would which would have been most likely at that time. However, we don't we don't just want to be coping in our marriage. We want to be thriving, right? And the way to thrive is to take those exact instances, occurrences, and turn them into a positive experience so that they can bring us and bond us even closer together. So look at this. Look at this here. Who knows what this is, right? And and the only reason I ask is because until a few months ago I had no idea what this was, right? So obviously it's a it's a it's a vase, uh, or a vase if you want to pronounce it, right? But who knows what type of vase it is? Anybody know? Japanese gold cracks. Yeah, it, it has a specific name. Anybody know the name for some brownie points? Okay, exactly, mashallah, Ahmed. Uh, it's called a kitsuji vase. Exactly. So, what's so special about this vase? Why, why, why have it, have we put it here? Well, the message that this is giving is that this vase, right, in its original form, it did not have these gold uh, lines on it. It was just a plain, simple, white, yet yeah, elegant way, vase. However, when this vase then broke due to some stress, us, a stress, some pressure, some, some incident, it fell on the ground and it cracked. It was then put back together, but it was welded and joined together using gold. And that meant that after it was repaired, it was even more beautiful than it was originally. After it was repaired, it was even more beautiful. So after this stressor, this incident occurred, it came back even stronger. Right, and this is something we see in, we see in uh, nature as well. And also on top of that, not just that it was more beautiful, it now has added value because it's it's with it's it's uh it's been able to uh maintain and bear that pressure, 
right? So it's also got added value. For those of the brothers here or even the sisters who go to the gym, this one they'll easily understand, right? That when you have a muscle, you want your muscle to grow. The way you grow that muscle, you make it bigger and stronger is by having micro tears in the muscle. Without those tears, the muscle cannot grow back stronger. So the point here is that these ch challenges which come upon us from outside, yeah, these natural disasters, we can call them, that come upon us from outside, Allah brings these in our marriages to make our marriages more beautiful, more valuable, more strong, and more well-bonded and well-connected. But the condition is that we approach those challenges and those problems in the right way with the correct mindset. Would you like to take the... Yeah. Okay, so now, um, if everybody wants to... We just want to do a small exercise with everybody, okay? So everybody close your eyes. If you everybody closes their eyes and just think of what I'm going to be telling you next, okay? So think of a, a time in your life, whenever it was, think of a time which was... Um, really difficult a difficult time for your life you had a lot of problems and difficulty whatever it was whenever it was when do you when was that difficult time in your life just think of it for a moment and just hold that thought for a second okay now i want everyone to now park that thought on the side and think now of a opposite the opposite the good time in your life Think of, I don't know, some holiday, you know, maybe on the beach, maybe a promotion at a job, maybe buying something new that you really wanted for a long time. Think of some good time in your life, a really happy time in your life. And just hold that thought for a minute. Okay, now that you've thought of these two things, now analyze out of the two the difficult time or the good time, which one drew you closer to Allah? Which was the time when you felt you were closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Most likely for most of us is going to be that time of difficulty. Agreed? Okay, good stuff. So what do we understand? It's times of difficulty. I mean, you can open your eyes now. Uh, it, it's, it's times of difficulty that bring you closer in such a way that good times are unable to do. Sometimes good times can't bring you closer. It's those difficulties that bring you closer, not just to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but also to your partner. Right? So it's like sometimes... You know, family, you know, don't really get on too well, but then a relative falls ill or is nearing their end of life, unfortunately. And that's the time that brings all these siblings and whatever together. And it really bonds them. You know, uh, it, it happens sometimes. So that's the point. The point is that difficulties that come upon us, like you see difficulties coming upon the Ummah right now or across the world, this brings people together. So we have to take advantage of these opportunities you can say we call them opportunities because this is what this world is all about okay if we don't make these difficulties you know points of where we become hopeless from allah you know we think why did we get this difficulty that's not that's not what a mu'min is that's not a believer we think of these difficulties and opportunities inshallah now <clears throat> The point that we're uh, kind of emphasizing quite strongly here is that when difficulties come upon us from outside, we have to see them as opportunities. We don't see, oh, why? Oh, Allah, why us? Why did this have to happen to us or to me? No, rather we use it as a chance not to turn away from our partner, but to turn towards our partner and turn towards Allah. And research actually shows us that when you share your problems with somebody, when you share your vulnerabilities with somebody, that is actually what glues you to somebody. So, I mean, think about some of your best friends. 
when did somebody go from the stage of being a good friend to the stage of being your best friend? Oftentimes that happens when you've shared a secret with them, something very personal or something deep, or they've supported you at a time of difficulty. You've shared a problem with them and now they've been there at, at your side. So the same applies to a marriage, that when couples and partners share their problems with one another and listen attentively and openly, and they are vulnerable with one another, and this is something men often struggle with, then this vulnerability, this sharing of problems and sharing of this challenge, it glues the couple together, right? This is, of course, you know, provided that your partner is sincere. And because, uh, you know, somebody might object and say, well, I share my problems with my partner and he or she just dismisses them, you know, do doesn't just, just ignores them, thinks I'm being a drama king or drama queen, right? So this is where your partner is open to understanding that this can become a very strong way to bond you together. And, and this is something that we often see in counseling sessions, right? So uh, Muftisab, there was that incident, uh, maybe perhaps you could elaborate on, where uh, the Scotland camp that you went to, where you saw something like this. Yes, yes, yes. This is um, our first camp that we did. I'm, I'm sure Monim Maaf mentioned that our organization, we're trying our best to try to revive families. And um, our, our kind of motto, you can say, is the triple C. We're doing courses like we're doing now courses camps and obviously counseling so the camp that we're doing is like obviously like a retreat we have the families and we we go together and we try to bond actively we try to bond each you know the families so there was a couple um that i was counseling at the time and um alhamdulillah they liked the counseling so they decided i mean uh the wife reluctantly i mean she wanted to come for our camp but uh, she wasn't Truly, really pleased that her husband was coming. At the time, her husband was living. Uh, they were both separated. They were living separately because they weren't getting on. So anyway, um, the husband found out that she's going, so he wanted to come along. So then he came along, and she was like, "Oh, do I have to come with him and the rest of it?" But anyway, alhamdulillah, they came. Just in what four four days, three nights that we had spent when they were going back. Alhamdulillah, they messaged to say that uh, they they are now, they're moving in together and they're living together now, Alhamdulillah. So just to show how, you know, um, in, in, in terms of they come sometimes and um, they express their, their vulnerabilities, you know, because when they were mentioning during their counseling sessions, they were mentioning certain vulnerabilities, certain things that they weren't happy with about their partner. The partner, the other partner felt really upset that, well, oh, are you are you actually saying this? Are you do you actually feel like that about me? Like, you know, so they actually feel like that first. But then eventually what happens when they get over that, that feeling, then they start realizing that actually, you know what? Um, you know. Uh, my partner, my partner is, you know, um, is is expressing to me how they actually feel. So they actually start to bond, like you said, that when you you share these vulnerabilities, when they did share the vulnerabilities, they actually became so strong that they were ready to move in together again. Mashallah. So Jazakallah khair for that. So 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 that's just one example, right? Amongst many examples. Now, I do appreciate that, that some people are mentioning that, you know, sharing vulnerabilities can backfire um, or it can be brought up later. Now, again, this is why we have um, conditioned this with the idea of your partner being sincere. All right. So when your partner is sincere, they want to listen to you. Um, and remember, when you're sharing problems on both sides, if you're both now going to start using them as fodder and as fuel to attack the other person, all right, it's going to destroy the marriage you get to a stage of sharing problems and being vulnerable because you're bonded together, because you see your future together forever and you feel comfortable. And so at that stage, when you do that, inshallah, it only helps to bond you further, right? So it's just like, imagine you don't know somebody. You're not going to start sharing your deep problems with them. But it's only when you get to a certain level of friendship where you now start sharing. And when you start sharing, that friendship becomes even deeper and even stronger. So that's just one thing we want to understand that, again, these problems that we have, if we approach them in this way, then inshallah, they will become a means of further bonding 
and further strengthening our marriages. At this point, I've mentioned before. So if you see, um, the, the point we're trying to make here is it's, it's quite vital to understand that obviously when you are now the you're tied together now, your husband and wife, okay, you are bonded together through this nikah, through this marriage, we understand that marriage brings good times and obviously times of difficulty. Both times will come about. We have to know that, obviously we know that, and that's part and parcel of life. So if we, in in times of good, you know, times when we are, you know, happy and, you know, good times of life, we have fun. We have, you know, we're happy together and we enjoy the time. We make good memories. That's what we would do. That's perfectly fine. But when it comes to times of difficulty, then we must see it as an opportunity for growth, for an opportunity for us to learn how to bond better, how to understand each other, and how to make sure that these kind of difficulties that are um, brought upon ourselves by ourselves are not then brought about. We learn from mistakes that we make. And this, inshallah, will, will develop the relationship and make it better, inshallah. So everybody knows what's what's going on in in uh, Palestine right now, right? So there's no need to to detail that. But this concept that we're discussing, that seeing the positivity or seeing the opportunity to shine, to grow in a moment of difficulty, this concept we can take from the people of Gaza and the way they are dealing with the uh, calamity that has befallen them right now, right? So I mean. Look at this picture, right? What does this picture remind you of? Uh, just just from the recent last maybe two, three years, what, what, what does this picture remind us of? COVID, exactly, right? It reminds everybody of COVID. Why? Because in this country, when COVID happened and rumors spread that, oh, you know, the, the, the stocks are running low and there's not going to be any tissues, right? Uh, and a lot, among other food items as well, people started hoarding tissues. Right. So something as you know, now we look back at it and we think, oh, it just it was a virus. Right. Uh, so some, a situation like this in a Western country where we have all kinds of blessings. Right. The blessings are abound. Yet people went to the extent of storing tissues. And later, they even were trying to make a business out of it, trying to take advantage of others at that time. Right. So that's how we saw people react in our countries in the West, in these so-called first world countries at a time of difficulty and we compare that now with the people of Gaza right now and this is a, a picture you see this bakery or whatever is left unfortunately of the bakery and you see how respectfully the, the, the people have lined up and you see the women and children have lined up at a time where there's just a few bakeries for more than a million people and yet the people there's no pushing and shoving there's no hoarding there's care and concern so in this time of difficulty, these people have these people have shown their character, their akhlaq, and they have shown and become role models for the entire Muslim Ummah. And that's why we as people sit as Muslims sitting here in the UK or in Canada or America or wherever else, we feel so proud of the Palestinians. We boast about their iman, their akhlaq. Why? Because of the way they have dealt with difficulty. So we see this difficulty, it comes in life to make us stronger to raise our ranks, right? So that's just one example. Another example, some time ago, you know, maybe just a month or two ago, I came across this video. And subhanAllah, you see this little boy here. And honestly, this is a, it's a very, very heartwarming video, right? This boy here, you can see him. And we know that water has been cut off to Gaza. Water has been cut off. And so this boy, it's raining. In this video, it's raining. And he's collecting water in a bucket. And look how he reacts. He says, Alhamdulillah, Allah sent us rain to drink from. Allah sent us rain to drink from. Allah knows our suffering. He knows our plight. He knows the situation we're in. And so he sent us water. Now look at this, subhanAllah. If it had been any of us, we would have thought, oh my God, there's no water. Now I have to drink water in a dirty bucket. Or the tap is not working. There's no clean water. You know, we would have seen 
the lack of water around us. But instead, in that moment of difficulty, he chose to focus on the blessing, on the goodness that there was therein, right? And we say, there's a saying in English, that every cloud has a silver lining, that in every difficulty, there is goodness that you can take out. And so when we approach our marriages and our relationships with this positivity, with this mindset, that if a difficulty comes upon us, you know, my husband said something or my wife said something to me which was a bit mean or rude. This is a time for me to show patience, to show my akhlaq, to show my good character. You know, my husband maybe lost his job and especially at a time of cost of living. But no, I'll use this as a time to show that I am here to support you through times of difficulty. My wife, maybe, for example, she's currently going through uh, maybe some emotional difficulty. So I'm not going to just tell her, you're always, you know, having mood swings. No, I'm going to be there for her at that time to show that I am there to support you through thick and thin. So this positive mindset, when it permeates our relationship and our marriages, then inshallah, this will lead to a positive and peaceful marriage. There's one more example. Uh, Muftisab, if you could, you know. Uh, just, to, just to finish off these 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 examples now. So um, I'm sure this one was a very earlier on video. Many people would have seen this video went viral. And um, this was a father who, can you imagine a father who's just buried two of his young sons? And he's burying, he's just buried his two young sons who have become martyred. And he's saying, may Allah, have mercy on them. I mean, this is just incomprehensible how a person can be that, you know, um, with that much belief and yaqeen and so much conviction to, you know, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he then says, um, you know, as we see that tomorrow, you know, you will, he's, he's comforting the people around him and he's telling them that tomorrow you'll be taken back to Allah and um, will be placed in the highest levels of paradise. And he's saying so much more. The point being is that he could have sat there complaining that uh, why my children were taken before me and whatever else he could have complained about, complained about. But you see, he's been seeing this as an opportunity to be proud, to be the father of two young martyrs. And he's just buried his 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 two daughters, sorry, two, two, two sons. And we see... Uh, a, a similar example here where there's this young girl here young innocent girl and she's being asked after her father has been martyred that are you proud that your father is a martyr and she says yes so she could have complained she could have said my father's passed away what am i going to do and everything else right but she sees this again as an opportunity to be thankful to allah and understand the rank that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is granting them because of the difficulty that they're going through. So this is just obviously because these are current affairs that are happening around us, we can learn a lot from it of how we can remain positive in our lives, in our marriages. And, you know, we've got so much to learn from, from them. And um, Mufsab, just one related question, just because it is very related. Uh, one brother, he asks, that what can be done when one spouse is positive and the other spouse is always negative, even in happy times? Can the positive eventually rub off on them? I mean, inshallah, you hope that the positivity does rub off on them. But if it is a matter of constant negativity, then maybe they might need, obviously, some sort of therapy, some sort of uh, um, you know coaching to understand what it is that's creating this mindset in them. Because sometimes, obviously, in certain um, ways of you know, people being brought up might be creating this kind of default negative mindset, you can say, which we will talk about um, as we go along, inshallah, in this presentation as well. Okay, so Alhamdulillah, we've discussed positive deeds, which was our recipe number one for um, a peaceful and positive marriage. Recipe number two was having a positive mindset, even in times of difficulty, even when problems come upon us that are out of our control. And recipe number three, ingredient number three, sorry, I should say, in our recipe, was have making or having positive assumptions. And this especially applies because this is what we call a man-made disaster. 
right? Where we have negative assumptions and create a disaster with our own hands. So what do we mean by that? Uh, I just want you guys to look at this graph, inshallah. So on our x-axis here, right, number of incidents, and y-axis, you have distance from reality, right? So what happens? A certain incident occurs. And from that incident, you decide, you know what, I'm going to, or not you decide, but maybe it's programmed like that. And you take the negative assumption. You look at it negatively. So with that first negative assumption, you got your assumption wrong and you're slightly distant from reality. Something else that happened and you continue to make negative assumptions. And now you're getting further away from reality. Something else happens. And now in your mind, you are joining non-existent dots. That, oh, this happened and this meant this. And this happened and this meant this. Therefore, this means this. Right? And inshallah, we will provide that example. And as you continue on this path, it then becomes even harder for, to, for you to see the reality, to see the waqi, to see what things are as they really are. Eventually, you do this to such a level that you are now self-convinced. Nobody can tell you otherwise. And finally, you end up far, far away on another planet somewhere, you know, in your own little bubble that you've created in your head, right? And this is the harm of negative assumptions. And this is the disaster, this man-made disaster that some people cause in their marriages. And this is something to be very wary of. So Mufta, perhaps you could give us an example, a practical example, uh, to put this theory into practice. Yeah, so um, let's just make an example here to make everybody understand. If we keep that 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 uh, the 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 graph there, so we can explain what that graph is all about. So, so for example, so let's say um, let's just make up two people. So we've got Maria; she works with Fatima, right? So now what happens is one day. I mean, they normally work in a just just build a picture. Everybody they work in an office um, environment. They've uh, they normally sit next to each other. Okay, so um, um, yes, my mother, you can, you can. So so you so let's say for instance, we have Maria. One day she offered, um, oh, surely Fatima should I say Fatima offered Maria some perfume, right? So she bought this nice. Chanel perfume and um yeah she pulled it out and she offers she offers Maria some perfume so Maria thinks that um because that day Maria she woke up in a bit of a rush and um she didn't get an opportunity to have a shower which she normally does but today she didn't get an opportunity because she was she was a bit late, so she had to rush into work. So when Fatima was pulling out this perfume, Maria thinks that um, Fatima's trying to say I smell. So she's like now trying to you know smell a little bit of a you know under armpits without anyone knowing seeing if she actually does smell or not. You know, reluctantly she takes the perfume from Fatima and she sprays it on herself and then she gives it back. But obviously, in her head, in Fatima's head, she's, I'm sorry, in Maria's head, she's thinking that we're trying to say our smell or something. Nevertheless, she lets that fly. She lets that carry on going. Then what happens during the day later on? Um, Fatima, she offers um, Maria some, some mint, right? So Fatima's having some mint and um, she says, oh, you want some? And she gives it to Maria. And now Maria thinks that, what, what are you trying to say? My breath smells now. It's, my breath stinks. Is that what you're saying? So she takes the mint and she eats it. But she's thinking that, oh, she, she actually does think I'm, I stink, in it? I smell it. She actually does think that, doesn't she? Anyway, some days later, what happens is um, when Maria comes into work, um, they're sitting next to each other like usual. And Fatima gets up and opens the window. Now, today is not a very particularly hot day but Fatima opens the window so Maria starts to think that what's she trying to say she actually doesn't believe I stink isn't it I smell that's why she opened the window because she can't bear my smell okay so now she is thinking this then what happens um you know she comes in to work one day and she finds Fatima sitting next to somebody else she's moved spaces so she's no longer sitting next to Maria. 
So then now Maria is really now, that's it, it's done. That Maria definitely feels as though Fatima, Fatima thinks I stink, I smell, I, I smell really bad or something like that, you know, smell. I'm not, yeah, it's game over for her. She's thinking that's it, you know. So that day at lunchtime, she blows it. She blows it on Fatima. You know, something happens, a little thing happens and she gives it to Fatima. She really goes on to go on to her, you know, comes down onto her as a, as a ton of bricks and she really kicks off with her. Right. Now, obviously, Fatima is a little bit distraught. What's happened here after work? You know, Fatima gets together with Maria and Maria is not really happy and she kind of ignoring her a little bit. But now Fatima says, what's wrong? What's happened? So Maria says it under her breath that you think I stink in it. I said, what? Where did you get that from? So yeah, you gave me perfume that day. Yeah, you're trying to say I stink. And then you gave me mint because my breath stinks, you think, isn't it? And then you opened the window when it wasn't even hot. Right? Yeah, you really wanted that fresh air to come in because you think I, I smell. And now today, what? You didn't even sit next to me, change places. That's the extent you want to get to, right? You think I stink? Tell me, tell me on my face. So Maria is now giving it to her. So for him, obviously, Fatima says, okay, okay, calm down, calm down. You know, let me explain. So Fatima explains that, you know, that day when I gave you perfume, that's because we had been talking about new perfumes you know we were talking about it that was a discussion and then you know i you suggested this perfume so i bought it so i thought you know because i bought it from your suggestion and you hadn't tried it yet i thought it'd be a good idea for me to bring it in my purse to work and i was i thought that you know you'd like to try it so i, I was just giving it to you so you can try that new perfume that's all it was it was innocently me sharing that perfume with you. That's all it was. And that day when I was sharing my mint with you is because I've been brought up like that, that wherever I'm, I'm, I'm eating something or I'm having something, I share with other people. It's not the first time I've given you something. I just gave you mint that day because I was eating it. I didn't want to come across as though I'm sort of uh, some, you know, a miserly person or something. I was just sharing my mint with you. That's all it was. And that day when I opened the window, you know that I was in my periods at time. I was in my menstrual cycle and we we get these hot flushes so i was having a hot flush that day and i was like feeling really hot so i wanted the window open that's all it was and today when i sit next to somebody else it's not that i've changed places it's just boss told me that i need to get this project done with that same person so that i had to go sit next to them to make sure that this project is done by today it was a deadline so that's all it was and after i finished that deadline after i finished the project i was going to come back to sit next to you because that's my place that's all it was. So you see, the point here is that from Maria's perspective, when we looked at it, she built these incidents up, right? Which wasn't actually reality, but she made herself think of everything that had happened negatively. Everything was negative for her. And the negatives added up, they build up to the extent that they become such a reality for somebody that even when you try to tell them the reality, they don't want to believe it. They're saying that, no, you're actually making stories up now. You know, I actually, they actually believe their concocted scenario that they've got in their head. So this is why it's vital that we don't think in a negative way because it will only harm us. Like we're going to explain next one in the month. Okay, so um, as as Muktisab explained uh, through the example very nicely uh, and quite realistically, to be honest, uh, we can see how we can end up so, so far away from reality due to the dots that we have joined in our minds. So now applying this to our marriage situation, let's say that your partner does something you didn't like. Now, there's only two logical routes you can go down. Route number one, is you take the negative assumption. Oh, they did it even though I've told them 10 times. They did it because they just wanted to annoy me. Or because today in the morning, you know, I didn't, the tea wasn't right. So that's why he did it, right? So you choose the negative assumption. Or you can think about it positively. Maybe she just did it because she's just tired today. There's nothing against me, she's just tired, right? So the same incident, you can look at it negatively or positively. There's only two possible ways. Now, if you choose the negative assumption, 
what is the outcome? The outcome, number one, you're causing unnecessary problems. Because now based on these negative assumptions, you're going to build further assumptions. Secondly, you are now going to feel dissatisfied. Though I told him 10 times to do it, and he still intentionally does this again. Right? So dissatisfied. And eventually, it's going to lead you to an argument. And you're constantly doing the same thing. Don't you understand? Right? So these are just some of the harms. And of course, arguments lead to a breakdown of the relationship. So ultimately, in a nutshell, negative assumptions cause you to harm yourself. This is a man-made disaster, self-harm. On the flip side, the same incident, you took it positively. Well, that means you're going to have a better relationship, right? You're not going to you're not going to be upset. You're going to be happy because you thought about each and every incident that occurred in the best possible way. And ultimately, it's going to lead you to be satisfied with your partner. And so you've saved yourself from harm. So this is something very rational, very logical, very simple to understand that generally we should always, always, always try our best to have the positive assumption. And one of the things we've seen from our experience also is that one of the biggest changes that takes place when a couple goes from their honeymoon period to now being outside their honeymoon period is that they go from having positive assumptions generally about their partner to now looking at things negatively. So that's something very, very important to understand. So now, everybody, we just want to give you uh, an example of uh, what, what I mean about, you know, we say that uh, you want to have positive assumptions, we're saying, right? And I say that, uh, you know, you have to actively think positively, isn't it, we're saying? But some people, they say that, oh, you're going to make me think actively positive. But uh, isn't that being a little naive? Like, I'm just constantly being positive about everything they're doing, but I know they're doing it negatively. But that's fine. That's I mean, you can think of it. If you think that's your reality, you can think of it like that. But remember, it's only going to harm you. It's going to harm your relationship. The only choice you have is to think of it positively. And you have to actively do that. So let me give you an example to make you understand what I mean. So I teach, um, for those who know, I teach at uh, the White Thread Institute, Alhamdulillah, I have an opportunity to teach in a in in a in an institute in the mornings. So I bike to work. So myself, I bike it to work. Um and um an elder, you know, another teacher or teacher who's older than me, Alhamdulillah, he also bikes it to work. So both of us we bike it to work, Alhamdulillah. Now, obviously everyone knows that uh, you have to um you know the, you have to park your bike somewhere, right? So when I get to work there are two spots to park my bike, right? There is um, indoors, that is, I carry my bike indoors. So generally, I reach to, to work, to teach where I teach. I reach there before my colleague. And um, there are, like I said to you, there are two spots where you can pipe, park the bike. So you can park the bike on the first floor landing against the railing on the first floor landing. Or you can park it on the second floor landing against the railing and tie, you know, lock it to the railings there. So when I get there, obviously the first floor landing is empty and obviously the second floor landing is empty. But I choose to carry my bike all the way up to the second floor. And it's a heavy bike, right? But I carry all the way up to the second floor and I lock my bike there, right? Even though... As I go past, there is an empty, empty, empty slot, every empty space available on the first floor landing. Okay, so this is what I do every day when I go to work. So now, why do you think, everybody? Um, why do you think that I carry my bike all the way up to the second floor and lock it there, rather than looking at the first floor? What does everybody think? Okay, so people are saying because uh, strength training, okay, maybe to get myself uh, trained a bit long more. Yeah, maybe I've biked a long way already. Uh, that was maybe enough strength training for me. Um, yeah, create ease for the colleague. Yeah, okay. Um, easier for second person to park their bike 
yeah, very good to accommodate my colleague. He's older, yes, good. Um, yeah, so that the, uh, the my colleague, yes, he can have a convenient spot to park on. So everyone's saying that it's going to be because I want to, yeah, yeah, everyone's saying similar thing, mashallah, yeah, to accommodate for my colleague in essence, right, everybody? Okay, so I, I, I carry it all the way up to the second floor. That So your responses, your responses show me of your positive assumption of me, right? You, because your interaction with me is positive, generally, alhamdulillah, your your reaction, your 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 assumptions of me show that you are you are thinking of me in a positive way. Yeah, does that make sense? But the thing is, you wanted to see my action in a positive light, and thus you found a positive justification for my action, for my action that I carry my bike all the way up to the second floor. You. <laughs> wanted to think of it in a positive way because you think of me as a positive person you think you want to think of me as a positive uh, positively so that's the reason why okay but let's say let's say i was to tell you that the actual reason why i may be carrying my bike up to the second floor is perhaps um you know, because I want to keep it safe, like uh, um, one of you is mentioning, perhaps, yeah, so that maybe because the second floor has is less likely for it to get stolen there because there's less people walking past the second floor, whereas the first floor, there's a whole lot of people that are going to go on to the first floor, are going to walk past it. So maybe it's not because I have concern for my older, my older colleague. There, the real reason perhaps is because, like you're saying, that maybe I, I I think that the second floor of my bike would be more safe. So now, some of you could have thought of that, right? But, but many of you, I don't think anyone, maybe, hopefully not anyway, I don't think any one of you thought of that reason. Why? Because you wanted to think of my action in a positive way. You wanted to do that. Right, I didn't tell you that I carry my bike up to the second floor because I want to accommodate for my partner or for my, well, you know, for my, uh, for my colleague or anything like that. I didn't tell you that, but you wanted to think of my action in that way, which allowed you to think of my my action in a positive way. But if you wanted to, you could have seen my action in a negative way, right? And for those people who think that, yeah, actually, you know what, I did actually think of that, but I just didn't want to say it, right? Maybe. Maybe you're you you are thinking in a very negative way because there was absolutely no reason for you to think this of me. There was no reason for you to think that I would carry my bike up to the second floor because I I had a selfish reason. Okay, it, 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 the reality is that what you said, everybody, you said that it's because I accommodate for my partner. The reality is that I accommodate for my partner, my 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 colleague. He's older than me, so I wanna I want to do it for that reason. Yes, that is the reality. It's the truth, but. The truth could be that I want to keep it safer, right? It could be that. But the point is that you wanted to see my action in, in a positive way. And if you wanted to see my action in a negative way, if there was a person that doesn't like me much, right? They would see my action in a negative light, wouldn't they? So that's the point I'm trying to make to everybody here. The point is your partner is your partner, right? Your husband or your wife is your partner. If you are not going to think positively about the actions that they do, then it's not going to work out for you because you're going to constantly see what they do negatively. And there's absolutely no reason to think that way because it's going to create more problems between the two of you. <clears throat> so this is the point, everybody, that do think of each other's actions in a positive way. I mean, we can give so many other examples to try to give you an understanding of that. Uh, let's see if we have time to, to to try to even understand that better. But hopefully this, this example has, has made people understand the point of actively thinking positively regarding your partner. So um, just in relation to that, there was a very uh, interesting study uh, that uh, that I came across uh, in the in the process of research uh, in relation to this topic, and uh, it's some research done by a gentleman called John Gottman. So John Gottman is one of the leading Western researchers on marriage, and what he did was he conducted a study which he calls the Love Lab, 
uh, and this study was done about uh, in, in 1999. Uh, and what he did was that he filmed couples in their natural living environment. And his aim was, can I figure out which factors can help me determine whether this couple's marriage is going to be successful or it's going to fail? And eventually he developed a method whereby in just a 15 minute interview with this couple, he was able to predict accurately 91% of the time, right? Whether this couple was going to be successful together or their marriage was going to fail. And he said that simply it came down to the fact that when he interviewed them, if the couple spoke positively about each other, they projected positivity onto one another, then I was sure their marriage was going to be successful. And if they projected negativity onto one another, then I knew most likely their marriage would fail. And subhanAllah, we have this in a hadith where Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said that a believing man does not despise a believing woman. If there is a characteristic of hers he dislikes, then there will be another he is pleased with. So the idea is to look at the good in your partner. And this equally applies to the wife towards the husband as well. That look at the good in your partner, look at the positive, and refrain from looking at the negative as much as possible. Right? Uh, and there was one example with this other as well uh, that you did mention uh, in regards to a person praying salah. So perhaps you could uh, you know, test the students and see uh, the attendees if they've understood your example. Okay, okay. Let's let's see if let's see if this works. Let's see if this works. So everyone, you're gonna have to like uh, visualize this. Okay, this actually happened. This is obviously something that actually happened to me. So you let's see whether you can. Uh, all this this seminar, we've been trying to uh, make your mindset to become positively more positively inclined. Yeah, everybody. So let's see if this works now. Yeah. So let's say this is what actually happened. So I was in a a particular place where we were. Um, eating and um, after food we had to pray salat right so i was leading salat and the salat was being led in a room it wasn't particularly big so um i had to stand where the the imam's place basically was where the door would be and the door would open in on me um it would open in into the room right but I had to stand where the door was because that's the biggest space. If you sit, if you if you if you stand diagonally, if you understand, and the rows were behind me, there was no other place to actually stand. So what I did, I slightly moved towards the left where the door would not open in onto my head if somebody was to open in, open up, because there were kids running around everywhere. There were children running around, and um, and there were people still obviously performing wudu. And they were, you know, maybe going to perform, you know, join the Jama'ah or something, right? So anyway, what I did was I slightly moved towards the left, which meant that I had a smaller space now. And um, I prayed, I led the Salat from there, okay? After Salat, somebody asked me, and we finished everything, right? And somebody asked me that, oh, why did you, why did you sit, why did you go to the smaller space when you could have, you could have stayed? Because obviously after Salat, we discovered that nobody really opened the door, but I I prayed Salat at the smaller space. So why did you pray there? They wanted to know. So now what do you think? Why do you think, everybody? I prayed at the, you know, a space where um, where it was smaller for me to to uh, to do sajda. To avoid the door hitting my head. Okay. Some people said so. But worried about the door, don't want to. Yeah, so you see, two people, uh, there are two perspectives here. They were they were actually in real life when I asked them, so what do you think? So what I did is why I asked the Musallin, I asked the people that were there, and I asked them that, why do you think I did it? So just as everybody else is saying here, everyone said two reasons. Two reasons. One reason some people said was because you didn't want the door to hit your head. And others said that because um, if you were, if they opened it, somebody who just performed wudu and they wanted to join the prayer, and then they wouldn't be able to join because you're, you're standing at the door. So they're not going to be able to come in. So that's why you stood away from the door. 
So one is actively thinking of my action as positive. The other one may not necessarily be negative, right? But it's definitely not a positive, um, active positive thinking. Like my action, you're actively thinking of in a positive way. Does that make sense? So, yeah, I mean, it was actually for the second reason. So that because I thought that what well, if people want to join, I'm going to be getting in their way. So I had to stand away from the door a bit. So if somebody does open the door, they can come in and they can join the Jama'ah. Yeah, so that's the point. The point is a selfless reason as opposed to a selfish reason. So we have to put a spin on the actions of our partner. That's the point. Yeah, there's there's Jeff definitely different ways of looking at things. That's the purpose of this example. Yeah. Alhamdulillah, we've reached right near the end of the PowerPoint, and so just to quickly summarize the key takeaways, inshallah, uh, for everybody to take out, take away with them uh, to reflect upon. Number one, we said that we want to nurture positivity in our marriages with small deeds. Right, And just to leave you with one more stat, uh, they have what they call the magic ratio, which we discuss in more detail in our masterclass. But the magic ratio, to summarize, is the concept that if you want to have a long-lasting positive marriage, then your positive small deeds compared to your negative deeds should be a ratio of five to one. So inshallah, this is something we can implement. That anytime we do one thing, whether it be, you know, we cut our teeth, or we, uh, you know, for example, uh, maybe give a bit of a dirty look or something, we should make that up with five positive small deeds. And inshallah, that way, we will maintain the positivity in our marriage. And secondly, the rest of the PowerPoint, we discussed that we don't want to create problems. And one way that we often are culpable of doing that is by thinking negatively when we could have thought positively, right? At the same time, if problems do arise externally, then see them as opportunities, as opportunities for growth, as opportunities for bonding, for connection, and for strengthening our marriages. So inshallah, if we implement these key takeaways, we will have inshallah the basis for a very strong, positive, and peaceful marriage. Uh, Jazakallah khair, everybody for listening. And inshallah, we will now move on to the Q&A.